justice. From the unwritten comes the law which is sanctioned by use, because long-lasting customs, which are approved of by agreement of those who are used to them, resemble laws. Code of Justinian 1 a visit to the Momen Tribal Agency in September 2008 described further in Chapter 11 summed up for me the attitudes of most ordinary Pakistanis to the official judicial system, and how the Pakistani Taliban have been able to exploit this to their advantage. As Tasmir Khan, a farmer, told me, to the approval of the other local men sitting with him. Taliban justice is better than that of the Pakistani state. If you have any problem, you can go to the Taliban and they will solve it without you having to pay anything, not like the courts and police, who will take your money and do nothing. 2. Strikingly, his views were supported by the steward and the mullah of the local Malik landowning family whom I was visiting, and in whose dusty, sun-drenched yard we were sitting, men who were, if by no means members of the elite, then not part of the truly downtrodden masses either. The steward, Shazad, spoke approvingly of a recent case of Taliban justice. Last week, a woman and her husband from Shapkadar were killed. She was a prostitute and he was selling her. So the Taliban warned her twice, then arrested them, killed the husband, cut off her nose, gouged out her eyes and drove a car over her. The mullah, Zuer, retorted that. I agree that she should have been killed, because she had committed crimes, and after all hundreds of people are being killed in this fighting every day. But not the way they did it, by cutting her nose and eyes. That is against the Koran and the Sharia. However, he added that he too supported the Taliban because they bring quick and fair justice, even if it is often rough. The Taliban's work in our area has been good. If you have a problem you can go to them and they will decide your case justly in three days. If you go to the police station, they will take all your money and decide the case in 20 years. In Pakistan, only the rich get justice. So people are coming here from Charsada and even further to get justice from the Taliban. 3. From this, it can be gathered that the harshness of Taliban justice, so often denounced in the West and by Pakistani liberals, does not necessarily repel local people, whose local traditions of justice are themselves often very harsh indeed, especially as far as women are concerned. As the mullah pointed out, the punishment of the prostitute and her husband was closer to the Pashtunwali, the traditional ethnic code of the Pathans, than to the Sharia. Even clearer was the entire local population's absolute loathing for the state judicial system, and this was an attitude which I found among ordinary people across Pakistan. However, it would be wrong to see the Pakistani population simply as innocent victims of a vicious judicial system run from above for the benefit of the elites. Rather, justice in Pakistan is an extension of politics by other means, and everyone with the slightest power to do so tries to corrupt and twist the judicial system to their advantage in every way possible. Thus cases brought before the state judicial system are key weapons in the hands of individuals and groups fighting for national and local power, and in both the state and the traditional systems of justice, outcomes are determined largely by political considerations. That means kinship, wealth, influence and armed force, but also sometimes and to some extent the ability to win over public opinion in general. The means to do this have changed over time, with the modern media now playing an important role in some cases. In the various traditional systems of justice, the powerful always had colossal advantages, albeit occasionally qualified by considerations of religious morality expressed through the influence of the Sharia. In the Pakistani state judicial system derived from the British, to this built-in bias against the poor and weak is added the appalling slowness and complexity of the system, and the ruinous costs extracted by a largely predatory judiciary and police. All of this is well known to every Pakistani, and fear and even hatred of the state judicial system is general among the mass of the population, even among those who are exploiting the system assiduously to attack their enemies. As an Urdu couplet with parallels in many languages round the world has it, the day a lawyer was born Satan said with joy. Allah has made me today the father of a boy. 4. 
Yet at the same time, whether stemming from the teachings of Islam or from innate and universal human cravings, there exists among Pakistanis a deeply felt desire for a better form of justice. This has led to admiration in the educated classes for courageous human rights lawyers such as Asma J. Hanger, and to the, alas, exaggerated hopes attached to the lawyers' movement which began in 2007 against President Musharraf and has continued in a lower key against President Zardari. For many ordinary Pakistanis, however, this hunger for justice focuses on the Islamic Code of Sharia, and as subsequent chapters will describe, at least up to the spring of 2009, the Taliban's claim to spread Islamic justice was central to the growth of their popularity in the Pathan areas, and to the unwillingness of most Pakistanis elsewhere to support military action against them. In the words of Imran Aslam, president of GOTV, ask ordinary people here about democracy, and they can't really explain it, but ask them about justice, and they understand it well, because unlike democracy issues of justice are part of their daily lives. Also, a sense of justice comes from Islam, a third of the names of God have something to do with justice, fairness, harmony or balance. Issues of electoral democracy have no necessary relation to this, because in Pakistan electoral democracy has little to do with the will of ordinary voters. 5. It would be quite wrong, however, to see the Pakistani masses faced with the state justice system as simply the passive, sheep-like victims of predatory lawyers, judges, policemen and political elites. This is true, but it is also true that the vast majority of Pakistanis and Indians with even the most limited power to do so have contributed to the wreckage of the state judicial system by their constant efforts to twist it to their own individual or group purposes. One reason for this is the continual struggles for power which permeate Pakistani society, struggles in which politics and property are often inextricably mixed. In turn, these struggles generate and are generated by the lack of mutual trust that permeates Pakistani society, between but also within kinship groups. An additional and disastrous factor is also present. However much, in England in the past, men may have bribed or intimidated judge, jury and witnesses, while at the same time swearing hypocritically into their beer that the law was an ass, they still had a feeling that, however corrupted, the law was English law, with its roots in England and stretching back to the very beginnings of English history. No Pakistani can feel that his state law is Pakistani law in this sense, for the obvious reason that it isn't. It is British law, as transmitted by British rule to the Empire of India, adapted to the purposes of ruling India, and somewhat modified by Pakistani governments and parliaments since independence. All over the former colonial world, modern legal systems have been undermined by the fact that they were imposed from outside, have never been fully accepted by the mass of the population, and often clash with that population's traditional codes. This is also true to some extent in much of neighboring India. In Pakistan and other parts of the Muslim world, however, the state judicial system faces a dual challenge to its legitimacy, from traditional, informal and unwritten local practices and the moral orders and loyalties they reflect called in Urdu Rivaz, and from another great formal, written legal code, that of the Sharia. The state code and the Sharia are both by nature, Great traditions, in the legal sense, strongly and essentially opposed to the, little traditions, of the old local and kinship-based codes. They are in competition with each other to replace those codes, though both have at different times and in different ways sought accommodations with them. Indeed, the Taliban in the Pathan areas owes much of its success to its successful blending of Sharia and Pashtunwali. Both the state legal code and the Sharia are reformist and progressive codes in the context of Pakistani customary justice, especially as far as women are concerned. As will be seen in subsequent chapters, the most ghastly atrocities against women in Pakistan have been committed as a result of judgments under customary laws, not the Sharia. In the face of the, let us be frank, often barbarous, tribal traditions of the Baloch and the Pathans, the Islamic code stands where it stood when it was first created by the Prophet Muhammad to civilize the pagan tribes of early 7th century Arabia. This is something which British imperial administrators in the region fully recognized and sought to exploit. 
The competition of judicial codes is intimately related to the weakness of the state in Pakistan, and Pakistan's difficulties in developing as a modern society and economy. For the idea of the modern state is largely bound up with the idea of the population being subject to one legal code, to which the state itself and its servants are in theory at least also subject. This code is laid down by one legislative authority, and administered by one hierarchy of judicial authorities. Any officially sanctioned deviations from this code are fairly minor matters of religious jurisdiction. Unsanctioned deviations are ipso facto not just illegal but illegitimate. The population of Pakistan by contrast has a choice between the law of the state, the law of religion the sharia and local folk, tribal or community law. People move between these three codes depending on circumstance and advantage, often pursuing their goals through several of them simultaneously, as well as through violence or more often the threat of it. The authorities which are supposed to implement the state law in conjunction with the Sharia, very often end up following community law or even turning a blind eye to violence. Often this is because they have been corrupted or intimidated, but often, too, it is because the police concerned share the cultural attitudes of the populations from which they are recruited. So the nature of Pakistan is a negotiated state, in which authority is a matter of negotiation, compromise, pressure and violence, not formal rules, is exemplified by the area of law and justice. The custom of the country. State law and the Sharia are both formal, written codes. Customary laws which can also be described as community, familial or, folk, laws are informal and unwritten, but immensely strong, because they reflect the cultures of the people. These laws, as implemented by bodies of local elders and notables or the leading males of families, reflect the basic attitudes of the population across the South Asian countryside, and to a remarkable extent in many of the cities as well. These laws are weaker in northern Punjab than elsewhere, but still present even there, as Muhammad Azam Chaudhry's study of justice in a village in Faisalabad district makes clear. For a very large part of the rural population, these codes, and not the state law or the sharia, govern rules of inheritance, the regulation of marriage and sexual relations, and the punishment of a range of crimes, or the resolution of a range of local disputes. Local people, and Western commentators, are generally convinced that these laws correspond to Islam or are even part of the Sharia, which is not at all the case. The most famous, the most extensive, and the best studied example is the Pashtunwali, the ethnic code of the Pathans, but every traditional Pakistani, Indian, Bangladeshi and Nepali community has its own version. The only large population in Pakistan which has completely shed allegiance to traditional codes are the Mohajirs of Karachi, precisely because they were migrants who moved during and after 1947 from very different areas of India. These informal systems of justice take many different shapes, but in all cases both the shapes and the outcomes are closely influenced by local kinship and power relations. In the Western systems of justice derived from or influenced by Roman law, and in all the legal codes around the world which in modern times have been based on Western codes, all crimes should be punished, and the purpose of the law and the criminal justice system is, in principle, to abolish crime altogether. These are also the basic principles of the Pakistani state legal system, because this system is based on that of Britain. The traditional codes of Pakistan are based on quite different aims, the defense of collective honor and prestige, the restoration of peace, and the maintenance of basic order. In this much of Pakistan resembles many other heavily armed kinship-based societies. Since these kinship groups always really saw themselves at bottom as independent sovereign groups, it is logical that the laws that grew up out of these societies should in key respects resemble traditional international law more than modern national law. That is to say they are based on diplomacy as much as rules, they usually aim at compromise not punishment, and the possibility of pressure and violence continue to lurk in the background. This is in part because ideas of honor is or garret and dishonor are fundamental to the culture of most parts of Pakistan. A man, or a family, who fails to avenge certain types of insult or injury by violence will be dishonored in the eyes of their community and themselves, and nothing can be worse than that. 
Dishonor means lack of prestige, and lack of prestige means that the family's prospects will be diminished in every way. A British colonial judge, Sir Cecil Walsh, described that great and fateful word Izzat, as follows, in terms which also imply its direct link to violence, every Indian, from the highest to the lowest, has his Izzat, or name to keep. After his son, it is his most cherished possession, and if it is injured, he is an unhappy man. And in such a sensitive race there is nothing easier to injure than the Izzat. The injury may be purely imaginary, but it is no less keenly felt. He will neither forget it nor forgive the man who did it. 6. In the evocative local phrase, a worthy and respected man, does good Izzat, Aka Izzat Karna, or in the Patan territories, does Pashto, that is to say, follows the path of honor. This is not just a matter of individual actions and decisions, but a whole way of living one's life, just as a woman is expected to, do garret, in her dress, mode of behavior and above all, of course, sexual conduct. Walsh speaks of Izzat as an individual matter, but it is equally important to families, extended families and clans. Indeed, most crimes committed in defense of Izzat, and for that matter, most crimes in general are collective crimes, as other family members join in to help or avenge their injured kinsmen in battle, to threaten witnesses, to bribe policemen and judges, or at the very least to perjure themselves in court giving evidence on behalf of relatives. This is not seen as immoral, or even in a deeper sense illegal. On the contrary, it takes place in accordance with an overriding moral imperative and ancient moral, law, that of loyalty to kin. As Walsh himself recognized, in England, a very large proportion of crime is committed single-handed, and the average number of offenders per crime must be under two. The average number per crime in the United Provinces must be nearer ten than two. Seven violence is not frequent, or Pakistan would be in chaos, but it is fair to say that the possibility of it is often present somewhere in the background. Muhammad Azam Chaudhry writes that The decision to go to the police courts involves a risk of blemishing the Izzat. You often hear, if you are a man, brave and strong, come forward and fight directly. Why do you go to uncle police, and that the real battle of revenge could only be inflicted directly or by close relatives and not by the police or courts? But, on the other hand, if going to the police is only for the purpose of harassing the opponent and impoverishing him, it could become a source of adding to one's izzat, especially by winning a court case against one's rival. This competition of winning the cases in the courts between rivals leads to addiction to litigation. 8. During a visit to Sindh in 1990, a member of a great local landowning and political family in Shikarpur told me, If neighboring landowners see that you are weakening, there are always a lot of people to take your place, and they will hit your interests in various ways, like bringing lawsuits to seize your land or your water. If you can't protect yourself, your followers and tenants will ask how you can protect them. A semblance of strength must be maintained, or you're finished. The trick is to show your armed strength without getting involved in endless blood feuds. Such rivalries between families and clans are also conducted in the law courts, but the ultimate decision always lies with physical force. In the countryside here in Sindh, a man from a strong tribe can go about unarmed, when no one else can. This will only change if a proper judicial system is established here in Sindh. Western education changes attitudes to some extent, but people still feel a strong attachment to their tribe. It does make some of the Sardars more relaxed though, less likely to demand retaliation at the drop of a hat. Junaid, his younger brother, when he presides over Jirgas, tries to take a moderate line, and to seek compromise with other tribes instead of blood. Other Sardars and tribal notables do the same. That is why, although the Jirgas here are not officially recognized, the government and police use them all the time to settle disputes and prevent them getting out of hand. On the whole the feudals are more favorable to bring tribal feuds to an end because they are not carried away by emotion and see that in the end no one wins. Also, a Kalashnikov can kill more people in a week than were previously killed in a year, so things can more easily get out of hand.
All the same, no Sardar, however rich, can afford to be seen as a coward by his people. Aga Tariq, PPP Development Minister, shot a man from a Mughal family in broad daylight 500 meters from here. He had a love marriage with a girl from Tariq's family without permission, the girl has disappeared, so they must have killed her too. To kill Tariq or someone from his family in return, the Mughals would have to have tribal backing to protect them and give evidence for them. But they are basically a middle-class service family. The brother is in customs in Karachi. They are wealthy and well-connected in Karachi and even Islamabad, but they don't have the local influence and prestige necessary to get away with killing, even in revenge. So they filed a case in court, but Tariq and all his followers got sworn alibis, some were supposedly in hospital, some even got the police to swear that they were in jail at the time for traffic offenses. They'll never be convicted. And they won't be unpopular with the people here because of it either, people respect men who defend their family's honor. Even in jail such people are respected more by the other criminals, as people who have done the right thing, maintain their honor. And the speaker, by the way, was no rural thug, but a senior official of a European-based bank. Customary laws differ considerably among the different regions and ethnicities of Pakistan. Within the same village too, judgments according to customary law can take place at different levels and in different fora, according to the case in question. Everywhere, however, the basic unit is the same, just as it is in Pakistani rural and to a lesser extent urban societies. The, patriarchal, extended family, patriarchal, though as innumerable Pakistani and Indian daughters-in-law are bitterly aware, behind the patriarchal facade, the grey eminence, the greatest tyrant and the most ruthless enforcer of custom in these families is quite often the senior female. According to the traditional ideal, all cases involving only members of one extended family should be settled within that family, and by a patriarch relying on the consensus of the family. A situation in which different members of the same extended family appeal to outside judicial authority, whether state or communal, in disputes among themselves is generally felt to be a disgrace for the family as a whole. Disputes between extended families should also ideally be settled by negotiations between their wise and experienced patriarchs. When it comes to issues of sexual behavior and family, honor, a majority of cases are in fact settled at this level, all too often by the death of the woman concerned at the hands of her own family. According to all the customary codes, when this happens wider justice has no role to play at all, and alas, across most of Pakistan the state authorities receive little or no help from local communities in pursuing these cases, most of which go unreported. The same is true across very large parts of India. If however a case involves people from different extended families or relations within one extended family break down irretrievably, then outside help will be invoked by one or both parties to the dispute, either to prevent violence or to restore peace after violence has occurred. This help usually involves a mixture of mediation by some respected local figure or figures with judgment by a group of elders. In Punjab, as in North India, such a group is usually known as a panchayat, from a Hindustani word originally meaning council of five. In the Pathan areas, Sindh and Baluchistan, the name commonly used is the Pathan word for such a council of local elders and notables, Jirga. Among the relatively well-defined and structured Pathan and Balak tribes, such councils have a fairly regular appearance, and among the Balak and other tribes influenced by their culture, the Jirgas are presided over by the Sardar hereditary chieftain of the tribe concerned or a close relative. In Punjab they are much looser and less informal. If a case involves members of the same local Baradiri, then the Panchayat concerned will represent that clan involved, if members of different clans, then representatives of the whole village or at least its dominant landholding elements will be present. More rarely, representatives of different villages will meet to discuss disputes between them. Membership is informal and ad hoc, and emerges from a local consensus as to who is worthy of taking part. In the Pathan and Balak areas especially, a respected local religious figure may play a mediating role. 
The local village Mola, however, does not have any right to do so ex officio, a sign of the low respect in which these figures have traditionally been held. Judgments also generally emerge informally from local consensus. This is especially true when the alleged perpetrator of a given crime is some universally despised figure, or one who has committed an action which directly threatens the well-being of the whole community, for example, a miller who mixes sawdust into his flour. Such people may be punished by fines, by collective ostracism, or by some form of public ritual humiliation, like being paraded around backwards on a donkey with a blackened face, a South Asian version of the collectively imposed, rough music, in traditional English villages which gave rise to the expression, face the music. Very often the Jirgar Panchayat really only ratifies a communal decision which has in effect already been made. This is equally true of the greatest of all Jirgas, the traditional Loya Jirga, or Grand National Assembly, of Afghanistan. In disputes involving two families or clans, this decision in turn will be based not on any strict definition of formal justice, but rather on a whole set of shifting elements in which considerations of equity, of relative power and above all of communal peace will all play a part. Judgments will inevitably involve relative winners and losers, but because communal peace and family prestige are both of the essence, considerable care will usually be taken to save face on all sides and to arrange compromises. Here, compensation rather than punishment is of the essence. As Imran Aslam of GOTV continued, Pakistan works at one level which is informal. You could call it the informal moral economy, which keeps hitting back against the elites. Attitudes to the law are part of this. One thing that ordinary people here fault the state's Anglo-Saxon legal system for is that there is no compensation. Yes, they say, the law has hanged my brother's killer, but now who is to support my dead brother's family, who by the way have ruined themselves bribing the legal system to get the killer punished? Both the traditional justice systems and the Sharia are all about mediation and compensation, which is an important part of their appeal for ordinary people. 9. Some of the British themselves recognize these objections to their system, and from the time when they first introduced the modern Western legal system and modern Western administrative, and later representative, institutions to their Indian empire, some of them also sought to give a recognized and honorable place to traditional forms. One of the greatest and most thoughtful of British officials, Sir Mount Stuart Elphinstone, sought to safeguard and recognize customary law, because of the need for government, to escape the evil of having a British code unsuitable to the circumstances of the people, and beyond the reach of their understanding. 10. Since independence, a number of attempts have been made in both India and Pakistan to bring the Jirga or Panchayat into the regular state judicial and representative system. In India, Panchayati Raj, or basic democratic self-government, was for a long time the official Gandhian program of the Congress Party. Attempts under Ayub Khan and Musharraf to create basic democratic institutions in Pakistan, paradoxically as an underpinning of military rule, both failed in the face of the opposition of the political elites. When it comes to the judicial system, this issue in Pakistan must be divided into the informal and the formal level. At the informal level, policemen in much of Pakistan, but especially the tribal lands, frequently resort to customary judicial practices for the simple reason that, as so many of them stressed to me, given the reality of Pakistani society and police weakness, it would be impossible to operate halfway effectively without them. In particular, it is quite impossible to prevent, contain or end tribal feuds without recourse to tribal jirgas. As the chief of police in Larkana district in Sindh told me in 2009 echoing precisely what the police chief in the neighboring district of Shikarpur had told me 20 years earlier. We try to work between the state legal system and the tribal system. When the tribes fight each other, I try to first pressurize them by raids, arresting known violent characters or in extreme cases even the Sardars themselves, and holding them for a while. Then having taught them a lesson about not going too far, I get both sides around a table to negotiate. 
You can contain tribal violence by prompt police action, but to solve a conflict, you always end up with a jirga, because you can only end feuds if the two sides agree between themselves to end them. We are not like the army, we can't just shoot people until they obey us. In the end we live among the people and have to work with local people. If we don't, the whole system collapses. Statements like this exemplify the nature of Pakistan as a negotiated state, and also the way in which the Pakistani police and, indeed, much of the civil service are still basically a colonial era police force, or even a medieval one, dedicated chiefly not to the pursuit of crime as such, but to the maintenance of basic peace and order. In fact, the Pakistani police still operate on the basis of the British Indian Police Act of 1861, only slightly modified. This act was introduced in the immediate wake of the Indian Revolt of 1857, and its structures and regulations were drawn up on the basis of those governing the paramilitary police force in Ireland, also charged with holding down arrestive population. The element of negotiation in police work applies not only to major tribal feuds, but also to quite minor cases. Thus in the Tekel Police District of Peshawar in August 2008, an investigating officer described to me a recent case in which two neighboring families had fought each other. He said that they probably had long-standing issues with each other, but that the fight itself was the product of pure exasperation, heated to boiling point by a local electricity breakdown in the Peshawar summer. After an endless wait, an electricity repair crew was bribed by both families to turn up, but naturally had to go to one of them first. An argument erupted which turned to blows, and then pistol shots, leaving two dead on one side. Who started it? I asked. God knows, the policeman replied. They both say the other did. Does it matter? They weren't criminals, just ordinary people who got a rush of blood to the head. That's very common in this country. The men of the winning side fled to relatives in the Khyber Agency of FATA, from which it is especially now virtually impossible to recover criminals. The investigating officer said that the police tried a bit to arrest the men by asking the Khyber Tribal Agency for help and putting pressure on relatives who remained in Peshawar to get them to return and turn themselves in, but in the end we encouraged the family of the dead men to ask for a jirga to arrange a settlement and compensation, and both sides swore to accept its decision. They were paid 10 million rupees, I think, and in return they swore on the Koran not to seek revenge. Then they came to us and we dropped the case. 5 rupees to 20 million is the range of compensation for a murder, but sometimes the compensation can be in vehicles or property. Swara, the infamous Patan and Balak custom of handing over young girls in compensation, is greatly diminished these days because of education, at least in the towns. While the police at ground level are resorting to informal justice to get things done, some senior officers are thinking seriously about how the entire system can be changed so as to bring it more into line with popular expectations of justice and improve its effectiveness at the same time. Malik Naveed Khan, the thoughtful and able Inspector General i.e. Commander-in-Chief of the Police in the NWFP, took time off from fighting the Taliban in July 2009 to give me a fascinating lecture on the subject of restorative justice. This is a growing trend in approaches to criminal justice in a number of countries including New Zealand with certain parallels to traditional South Asian approaches. Naveed Khan has set up public committees attached to police stations in parts of the NWFP composed of respected local people coordinated by the local police chief to arrange reconciliation and compensation in a range of cases up to and including murder. Unlike in the informal jirgas, these committees are not able to make decisions reprisal killing, the giving of women, and so on, which contradict Pakistani state law. In his words, if we can regulate the jirga system and make it official, then we can prevent such illegal decisions while keeping the best aspects of the old system. After all, no one but the lawyers really wants to bring cases to court if they can avoid this. It is an immense burden to everyone concerned, including the police who here in the NWFP are in a life and death struggle with the Taliban. What is more, no one sensible wants to send people to jail, often not even the victims of crime, if they can be compensated by the perpetrator. 
prison only turns accidental criminals into professional ones, and anyway, all too often in Pakistan for whatever reasons they are let out again after serving only a small part of their sentence. 11. There is, however, a range of obstacles to the full integration of informal justice structures into the formal justice system. The first is obviously the economic interest of judges, lawyers and policemen, all of whom would stand to see their incomes from bribes and fees greatly diminished. This is related to the point that the informal justice system cannot work properly if disappointed parties are always in a position to appeal from local consensus to the police and the state courts, which, unlike the local community, can bring overwhelming force to bear in particular cases, at least if they are bribed enough. A second obstacle is that because they are ad hoc and informal, jirgas and panchayats usually have to be based on small village or tribal communities in which people know each other, know who has sufficient local respect to serve on a jirga, and also understand well both the personal characters of the parties concerned and the reality of power relations between them. This is less and less possible in Pakistan, where the population, and the urban share of it, are both growing enormously. This problem was brought home to me when in 2009 I visited Mingora, capital of Swat, after more than 20 years. The people of Swat still remember the autocratic but fair judgments of their former ruler the Wali, under a system in which the ruler presided personally over all serious cases, and knew personally every significant figure in his land. But when the Wali ruled Swat the whole territory had fewer than 500,000 people. Now Mingora alone, which I remember as a small country town, has almost that number, more than London or Paris in the 18th century. In a population this size, it is impossible to follow the old ways based on personal knowledge and local consensus. The existence of a parallel, legally unrecognized set of judicial institutions relying on local codes obviously calls into question the whole project of creating a unified modern state, which is why since early modern times royal authorities in Europe and elsewhere tried to stamp out these institutions and practices and replace them with a uniform code and uniform institutions staffed by centrally appointed judicial officials. This has been a challenge for India as well as Pakistan. In the words of the Indian legal anthropologist M. P. Jain, there is one other very important reason as to why custom should now be abrogated. Most of the customs are tribal or communal and sectarian, and so long as custom survives these class distinctions are also bound to survive. It would lead to a better integration of the people, if the sense of separation of each community arising out of its distinctive customs were removed. Point one two. Finally, in one key respect the question of the judicial role of jirgas and panchayats raises in acute form the clash of cultures between the Pakistani masses and the westernized educated elites which dominate the state and the senior ranks of the judiciary, which in turn raises a fundamental question about Pakistani democracy. This question relates to the treatment of women. Especially among the Pathans and Baloch, including the Baloch tribes of Sindh and southern Punjab, tribal jirgas are regularly responsible for ordering punishments of women which are absolutely odious not only to modern Pakistani state law and westernized sensibilities, but to the Sharia and strict Muslim sensibilities as well, but which, unfortunately, enjoy the support of the vast majority of the members of the communities concerned, or at least the males. These jirga decisions include, the execution of women for, immorality, and even for perfectly legal and religious marriages with men from other tribes, the giving or exchange of minor girls in compensation as part of the settlement of feuds, and, more rarely, orders of gang rape as a punishment. This last, however, is almost always limited to actions by one locally dominant kinship group to teach another one its place as in the particularly monstrous case of the rape in 2002 of Mukhtar Mai, a woman of the Gujar Baradiri in the Muzaffargar district of southern Punjab, on the orders of a jirga of the Mastoy, a local Baloch tribe. This is a tactic often used by superior castes in India as well to crush and humiliate the lower castes. This issue raises yet again the question of whether Pakistan is really, as most observers believe, insufficiently democratic, or whether on the contrary it is in fact too democratic for its own good, 
insofar as the views of a largely illiterate, obscurantist and often violent population are in a position to prevail over those of the educated elites, and the state is too weak to enforce its own official law. For it should be remembered that in 18th and 19th century Europe, key advances in judicial progress, and administration in general, which laid the foundations for modern European civilization, were carried out by small enlightened aristocratic and bourgeois elites. These often had to use authoritarian methods to crush the resistance of the mass of the population. They certainly never believed for a moment that the masses should be consulted about elite actions. This issue also raises the question of the difference between a truly, feudal, elite and one based on the leadership of kinship groups. A truly feudal elite, and one which did not have to stand in elections, might eventually summon up the will to be true to its own modern education and ensure that measures protecting women, of which there are plenty in law, are actually enforced. An elite dependent on the consensus of kinship groups to be elected to parliament cannot do so, especially because even in the most autocratic Pakistani culture, that of the Baloch tribes, there is in the end almost always some rival would-be chieftain waiting within the chieftain's family to challenge him if his support in the tribe dwindles. The reality of all this was brought home to me by the Sardar of one tribe in Baluchistan, a Patan tribe, but which, unlike the Pathans of the NWFP and Fata, had been heavily influenced by autocratic Baloch traditions. If his very candid and all-too-human account of his approach seems less than heroic, I invite you, dear reader, to ask yourself whether you or I would really do so much better. This Sardar is a, Nawabazada, the descendant of a tribal chieftain who fought against the British, but later compromised with them and was given the title of, Nawab, another sign of the old frontier tradition whereby yesterday's enemy is today's ally, and vice versa. His tribe straddles the Afghan frontier, but in Afghanistan his influence, though present, is greatly reduced. The Sardar's grandfather sat in the Pakistani Constituent Assembly of 1947. The walls of the Sardar's mansion in Kedar festooned with the heads of mountain goats and photographs of ancestors bristling with guns, swords and facial hair. The resemblance in terms of both hair and general expression was rather marked. The Sardar's own facial hair is more limited, a mustache and a pair of small sideburns, which together with his long curling hair gave evidence of student years in London in the late 1960s. He spoke of his time in London with deep regret as, the happiest time of my life, but with a disarming smile, admitted that, in the end, I just could not bear to live my whole life in a place where, when I walk down the street, people do not bow and say, Salam Alaikum, Sardar Sahib. The Sardar described his judicial role as follows, In my tribe, the poorest man if he gets into trouble will be helped by his fellow tribesmen, led by me and my cousins. Even if he drives a rickshaw or sells boot polish he can look anyone in the eyes because he has a chief and a powerful tribe behind him. Every month, hundreds of people come to me or my cousins to have their problems solved. If it is a simple case, we make decisions ourselves. If more difficult, we call a jirga, and from the jirga people are chosen as a committee to look into the case. We choose people depending on the nature of the case. If it is a transport problem, we choose people with transport experience. If business, then businessmen. If the parties to the case want it to be judged according to the sharia, we include a mullah. We make the judgment, and we enforce it. For example, a few months ago one boy from the tribe killed another boy. We are arranging compensation. They are both from our tribe, so that was quite easy. A more difficult case recently was when one of our women was raped by two young men from another tribe. We caught the men, and our tribal jirga met, and called witnesses according to the sharia and modern law. We consulted with the elders of the other tribe. They offered money compensation but we can only take this in cases of murder or wounding. To take it in cases of the rape of our women would disgrace us. Then they said, you can kill the older boy, but please spare the younger one. So we decided to kill the older boy, and slit the nose and ears of the younger one. The older one was twenty-something, the younger is sixteen. Rough justice, I suggested.
Yes, but if we had gone to the government law it would have taken years, and in that time they would have been free to roam the streets raping more girls and laughing at us. Relations between the tribes would have got worse and worse, and maybe in the end many people would have been killed. This is our tribal system which has existed for ages. If it had been bad, it would have been abandoned by the people. It is a hard decision, but we need to make sure that no one will think of killing or raping our people again. This system helps keep the peace and stops feuds getting out of hand. For example, we have just settled a feud with another tribe in South Punjab, over land. Six years ago, there was a clash. Two people were killed on each side, and four of our men are in jail in Multan for this. Our Jirga has negotiated a settlement with the other tribe, and they agreed to drop the charges. So this week we are going to Multan to bring our men from jail. We will give a feast for the Jirga of the other tribe at which we will formally forgive each other, and in two weeks, they will give a feast for us. Is this according to Pakistani law? I asked. There is no law. If there were a real law in this country, why would all these people come to me for help? I don't go looking for this work. I have important business in Karachi that I have to leave behind to do this. People come to my cousins and me because they respect us, not just because of our titles but because they know our character and know that we are fair. I depend on my people's respect only. After all, I have no official position, and no support from the police or the courts. I asked him about the punishment of women in, honor, cases, and how far, since he had previously spoken bitterly about the backwardness and lack of education of his fellow countrymen, he was able to bring his own more enlightened views to bear. Sometimes there is no need to set up a committee of the Jirga. If it is a very simple case and I know what the tribe thinks, I can just say, this is the decision. But issues involving women are never simple, and I always have to think about what the opinion of the tribe will be. The tribal setup is very hard, not just towards women but towards men as well. Remember, no one in this country has real rights. Because I have traveled and am educated, taking these decisions over women is not easy for me. I have to think and think about how to handle them. There are certain things I will not permit. For example, the first decision I made on becoming Sardar was that I will not allow the giving of girls in compensation. That is still very common in our system but I will not allow it. I will order money given instead, if necessary much more money. Also I will not punish a girl for wanting to marry or not to marry someone, as long as it is a proper marriage. If a couple run away together to get married without their parents' permission, I will put pressure on the parents to agree to the marriage, not to kill them. I may find the boy's family though so as to save the face of the girl's family. With such female problems I am very cautious. To be honest I try to avoid them whenever I can. If I can solve them without bloodshed, then I do so. Otherwise I send the case to my cousins to decide. And do they share your more enlightened principles? I asked. Well, that is up to them. But I do try, you know, when possible, and this has sometimes involved me in arguments with my own tribe. I can say in the end to the Jirga and the parties in a case, I don't agree to your verdict. This is my decision and if you don't like it, you can go to state law. But I can't do this often or no one would obey me anymore. I only do it sometimes in women's cases, because after all I am a father with daughters. If it's a business issue and I disagree with the Jirga, I won't take a stand, after all, businessmen can always get their money back somehow. I cannot say whether this Sardar did in fact try hard in, women's cases, but at least he seemed aware that he ought to. As will be seen in Chapter 8, the other Sardars I met in Baluchistan simply defended tribal custom tout court, they also claimed to be modern and educated men, and, of course, good Democrats. The Police the problems affecting the police and the official judicial system in Pakistan are so many and so great that it is hard adequately to describe them, but one single word that explains many of the others is yet again, kinship. In the words of a police officer in central Punjab. 
families and clans here stick together, so if you really want to arrest one person here and prosecute him successfully, you may need to arrest ten, or threaten to arrest them, the original suspect plus three for perjury, three for bribing the police and judges, and three for intimidating witnesses. And if the family has any influence, the only result will be to get yourself transferred to another district. So I'm afraid that it is often much easier just not to arrest anyone. Take the FUR first information report system. If two individuals or families clash, and someone is killed, the dead man's family will lodge and fur with one police station saying that he was wantonly murdered, and the other family will lodge and fur with another police station saying that they were attacked and acted in self-defense, and they may be telling the truth. The police and the courts have to judge between them on the basis of evidence, every bit of which is probably false in one direction or another. So either the case goes on forever, or it is resolved in favor of which side has more power and influence. If it's an especially bad case and you are sure of what happened, you may be able to bargain with the family or with local politicians to give you the man you want. But then of course you will have to give them something in return, or let one of their members off in some other case. This is typical give and take, what we call here Lena Dina. The problem for the police and the courts begins with lying. Astonishingly, at least, it astonished me, it is not permitted in Pakistani courts to swear on the Koran, that is, the book itself, not in the words of the Koran when giving evidence. I asked Saeed Mansur Ahmed, vice president of the Karachi Bar Association, why ever not? It's very simple, he replied with a cheerful smile. Most people would swear and then lie anyway. That would bring religion into disrepute, and you are not supposed to do that in Pakistan. British officials working in the field recognized this problem and attributed it to their own system, drawing a contrast yet again with traditional local jurgas and panchayats where, since everyone knows everyone else and the basic facts of the case, outrageous lying is pointless. In the words of General Sir William Sleeman, commander of the campaign to suppress Thuggy, I believe that as little falsehood is spoken by the people of India, in their village communities, as in any part of the world with an equal area and population. It is in our courts of justice where falsehoods prevail most, and the longer they have been anywhere established, the greater the degree of falsehood that prevails in them. 13. Denzel Ibbotson, the great colonial administrator and ethnographer of the Punjab, writes of the ordinary Balak being naturally frank and honest in his statements, except where corrupted by our courts. Once again, the people doing the lying and manipulating would in most cases not feel that they were acting immorally, rather, that they were obeying the higher moral law of loyalty to kin. And, once again, there is no essential difference in this regard between the big, feudal, politician and the small tenant farmer. They all, each according to their station and resources, do their utmost to help relatives and allies by deceiving, corrupting or pressuring the police and the courts. Pressure can be directly physical, especially in the case of the Islamist extremist groups but more often it comes through political influence. This goes up to the very top. Thus in 2009 I was sitting in the office of the Inspector General of Police in one of Pakistan's provinces, when a call came through from the province's chief minister, who was roaring so loudly that I could hear him through the receiver from several feet away. He was complaining that a superintendent of police had arrested a decoit bandit leader at the rural mansion of one of his party's provincial deputies. The unfortunate inspector had to promise an inquiry, the decoit's immediate release and the immediate transfer of the offending police officer to another province. And this chief minister, by the way, has a personal reputation for efficiency, hard work and relative honesty. A senior officer in Punjab told me that around half of the 648 station house officers chiefs of local police stations in the province are chosen by local politicians through influence on the Punjab government to serve their local interests. Furthermore, the state judicial system is not merely politically reactive, but is also regularly used as an active weapon. A great many artificial cases are brought deliberately by politicians to attack rivals, and by governments against their opponents. 
The manipulation of such cases and their outcomes is also a key tactic of the ISI Inter-Services Intelligence in managing elections by forcing particular candidates to withdraw or to change sides. A situation of nearly universal mendacity and political pressure concerning their work would place an intolerable burden on even the best equipped, best trained, best paid and best motivated police force in the world, and the Pakistani police like the Indian are very, very far from being any of these things. The miserable conditions in which ordinary policemen work was brought home to me by a visit to a station house in the suburbs of Peshawar in August 2008 responsible for an area where there had been 18 murders so far in 2008. I spoke with the sub-inspector in charge of the investigation unit in the room where he and the other officers sleep and eat during the day and night that they spend at a time on duty. It was a slum, with bare concrete walls, stained with damp from the leaking roof. My visit was during a power cut, the ordinary police of course have no generators, and in the monsoon the whole station was a hot fug of rotten sweat. The office's clothes hung on pegs, and there was a mirror for shaving. That, with their charpoys, string beds, and a couple of chairs, was all the furniture. The sub-inspector is a big, very tough-looking middle-aged man with enormous fists, not a good person to be interrogated by. I asked him what the police in the NWFP need most. He gave a harsh laugh. Where to begin? First, we need better pay and incentives. Look at the motorway police. Everyone says how honest and hardworking they are, well, that's easy, they are paid twice what we get. We need better accommodation, look at this place. We need better vehicles, better radios, better arms, bulletproof vests. Tell me, could any police force in the world work well given what we have to rely on? Would you risk your life fighting the Taliban for the pay we get? He told me that at that time there was one fingerprinting machine for the whole of the NWFP, and, as his seniors candidly admitted, it was almost completely useless, both because of the inadequacy of the archiving system and because the ordinary police have no training in taking fingerprints. This is also true for the greater part of Punjab and the whole of interior Sindh. And indeed, all this is irrelevant, since the police have no training in how not to ruin all evidence by trampling over a crime scene. This is generally the case even of the Interior Ministry's special service, the Intelligence Bureau. It helps explain the shambolic nature of the investigation into Benazir Bhutto's assassination, which has generated so many conspiracy theories. To lack of equipment and lack of training can be added lack of numbers. Visitors to Pakistan who see large numbers of police guarding official buildings or accompanying politicians may think this is a heavily policed society. In the main cities, large numbers of police can indeed be called upon if required, but in the Punjab countryside, there is one police station for approximately every 50 villages. Incidentally, the figures in much of rural India are even worse. Most policemen with whom I spoke had no real idea how many people there were in their areas, or even, very often, how many serious crimes had been committed there over the past year. The result of all this, as well as of lack of incentives, and a certain doziness, exacerbated by the heat, is that most of the time the police are purely reactive. You never see a speeding police car in Pakistan whereas you do occasionally see speeding ambulances and fire engines unless, once again, it is accompanying a senior politician. The police wait in their stations for cases to be lodged with them, and, in the case of murder, for bodies to be brought to them, which naturally makes any forensic examination of the crime scene out of the question, even if the police had the training or equipment to carry it out. Since the population is mostly illiterate, the police can often write down whatever they like on the fur and get the witnesses to sign it. Unless the police see some money in it for them, this often means that cases are simply never registered at all. A standard part of the police investigation technique is the torture of suspects, relatives of the suspects, and witnesses. Most police officers are completely candid about this in private. A senior officer in Punjab told me, I am trying to introduce fingerprinting, forensic examination and so on, but there is a cultural problem. 
The response of the ordinary SHO's station house officers is, oh, this is just another hobby horse of our overeducated senior officers. I prefer the reliable method. Put the suspect on the mat and give him a good kicking. Then he'll tell us everything. The investigating officer I spoke with in Peshawar described a recent carjacking case in which the suspect had absconded to the moment agency with the vehicle. So we arrested his father, and put pressure on him to get the car back. If he had been a young man, naturally we would have beaten him till he told us where it was, but, since he was old, we didn't torture him. We just threatened him in other ways, with cases against other people in his family, everyone in this society is guilty of something. We told him that we would talk to the political agent in moment and get his family home there demolished if he didn't help us. So in the end he sent someone to bring the car back. Together with the general police tendency to take bribes in return for every service, it is hardly surprising therefore that people avoid the police as much as possible, and try to resolve crimes in informal ways. As to the idea that it makes any difference in this regard whether Pakistan is ruled by a civilian or military government, the Peshawar investigator answered that question categorically. I visited his station house the day after Musharraf's resignation as president. I asked him if his use of torture would change now that Pakistan was a democracy again. If I had turned into a purple elephant his look could not have been more blank with amazement. I had asked not just a meaningless question, but one with no connection whatsoever to any reality he knew. None of this however is necessarily timeless or set in stone. Some dedicated and intelligent senior officers are working hard to improve things, and the National Motorway Police, mentioned by the sub-inspector, are an example of what the Pakistani police can be when the circumstances and conditions are right. Their high pay makes them resistant to bribes, and because they are commanded from Islamabad they are immune to local political pressure. Perhaps equally importantly, they work in a context, that of Pakistan's splendid modern motorways, with their gleaming service stations and roadside cafes, which gives them legitimate pride in their country and their service. In consequence, they are amazingly honest and efficient. My driver was given a ticket for speeding on the way from Islamabad to Lahore, with no suggestion that he could be let off in return for a bribe and I heard numerous members of the elite complain with astonishment that the same thing had happened to them. Then again, Pakistan's motorways often seem in a way to float over the country without being connected to it, so it is natural that their police should be the same.